I was born in Jaipur uh, in 1976. And um, since all of you seem much younger, I should remind you that in 1976, I had, um, I mean, there was no, there was no cell phones, no computers, no internet. Um, so this is a totally new world uh, for anybody who's in school in Jaipur. Uh, I studied in um, Maheshwari Public School. Do you know that? Okay. Anybody from MPS over here? Not really. Okay. So um, I'm not going to talk so much about myself right now. You can ask me if you have any questions. Um, and I'm going to sit down at first, tell you what I actually do. So uh, that's because I have a knee problem after three years of uh, running a marathon. Uh, so, as Tarun mentioned, I'm a historian of science and mathematics. Have you ever heard that profession ever? Has anybody heard of a historian of science and mathematics? That's what makes me unique. So, what I do is, for example, um, have you seen this movie called um, Detective Vyomkesh Bakshi? How many people have seen it? That's a lot of people. Okay. So the rest of you might want to close your ears because I'm going to tell you the story now. Uh, the plot centers around uh, Vyomkesh Bakshi hunting for this professor who's invented a new formula. Uh, can anybody tell me what the formula was about? That's right. Uh, he said heroin, which is a very dangerous drug. It's made from opium, which is uh, very infamous in Indian history, our history, because this is what the British East India Company made from the poppy harvest in Indian um, farms using our farmers and sold to China and other markets and made most of its money. And opium gives rise to morphine, which is a sedative given to soldiers who've been wounded. It was used in the First World War and the Second World War. So what Byomkesh Bakshi, the movie, does is it says the new formula that the professor has created is something unique. What it does is you take the opium, you, you inhale the opium through a pipe, but as it goes into your bloodstream, there's a chemical reaction with the blood and it automatically, magically becomes heroin. So the value of the drug in the market goes through the roof, creating profits for whoever is selling it. That's the basic plot of the film. Uh, you can watch the movie. It's still a fun movie. But the idea here is, how do you say... So obviously, this kind of opium never existed. It's a fictional movie. It's, it's not real history. It was made up for the film. The real history is that um, the most quality opium which was sold in the world markets actually came from Rajasthan. And you had to have the chemical expertise to test that drug so that it could be sold in the market. You had to be able to have the, agric the agricultural expertise, the, the pesticides, the fertilizers, and the scientific knowledge of botany to grow opium extremely efficiently. Not only that, how do you, how do you take opium from the factories of Ghaziabad and Patna upstream on a steamboat up the Ganges River to Canton, to Macau, to China? How do you do that? You need steamships. You need steam power. Who invented the steam engine? Uh, how do you navigate a sea in a storm, uh, you know, when you can't see the stars? You don't know how to find your way. You need a magnetic compass or some other sophisticated instrument. So you see, what I'm trying to tell you is that the way the East India Company or any other empire has been built is on the power of science and technology. And one of the most important things um, um, that... I study is how science throughout history 
has impacted um, the world. So we live um, in Jaipur. And um, so who was the most famous king of Jaipur? There were two. There was Jaising one and Jaising two. So what's the most famous thing he's built in Jaipur? Jantar Mantar, that's right. Um, have you all been there? Okay. So Jantar Mantar is basically a garden of sundials, which means, uh, so a sundial is an instrument um, which essentially, so uh, you know the earth is rotating and it's not the sun that's actually moving in the sky. It, it looks like it, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is the earth is rotating and that's what makes the sun move. The sun is there. But because the sun, because if, you, if I put a, so this, if that is the sun or one of these lights, there are too many suns over here, but if we had only one, and if I had just one stick, it would be a sundial. That's how simple a sundial is. And using that, you can tell the time. You can tell a few more things. You can tell, so Earth is a sphere. Now, depending on where I'm at the North Pole or at the equator, the way the shadow moves is going to be different. So you can even tell where you are on the Earth using a sundial. Now, Jaising is a very, very interesting character, and I'm, and I'm telling you specifically about him because I'm from Jaipur. He has fascinated me throughout my life. Um, and so should, uh, you should know about his importance in the history of science. So Jaising um, took throne uh, at a very young age, younger than you guys. He, he became the king. Uh, when he was about 11. And um, at that time, the Britishers were trying to take over, the French were trying to take over, the Marathas were trying to take over, the Mughals were sort of crumbling, but they were still there. So there were a lot of wars during Jaising's time. And for some reason, this guy started taking an interest in astronomy. You guys know what astronomy is? Would somebody like to stand up and tell me? Yeah, please. The science of learning about this, uh, about the bodies which are present in the space. Great. That's a very interesting answer. Um, so for a long time, we did not even know that they were bodies. For a long time, they thought stars are just points. They are holes in some kind of quilt or fabric. They didn't know there was an actual body. They didn't know that the sun is actually almost the same thing as those things in the night sky, that it's a star. They never knew that. But your answer is correct. So now I want to tell you specifically about what Jaising started doing. Jaising was a worshipper of the sun, he, Surya Vanshi, right? So um, he started taking an interest in studying the movements of the sun. Uh, at that time, astrology, now astrology is different from astronomy because in astrology, what you do is you study how the planets are moving through the night sky or through the stars, and from that you try to predict human lives. Now, there's no direct correlation as such. It's completely psychological, but throughout history, people have done that. So, um, at that time, they would sort of combine astrology using measurements from astronomy and try to use that. So like, you can't actually rule a country without having a very fixed calendar. You need to know when the farmers have to put the seed, when they have to harvest, uh, and you have to know when certain festivals fall. But because of the very uncertain nature of the way the earth moves around the sun, the dates keep shifting unless you keep correcting it annually. And that's why precise astronomy was important for astrologers to predict the future of a country, a king, or a harvest, or a family. So Jaising took it really seriously. And so this was the time um, when 
the European scientific revolution was at its peak. In fact, if you study uh, the, the year from 1600 to 1900 coincides exactly with the rise of the British Empire. So that there's a perfect um, uh, timely correspondence between the rise of science and the rise of the British Empire because they could not have done it without science. So Jai Singh started calling people from um, Portugal, from France, to help him prepare new astronomical tables based on European knowledge so that he could create more accurate tables over here. But um, the people he called were not so efficient. So um, they imported the tables which were based on the latest theories, but they failed to read them correctly. And therefore, the Jantar Mantar that you see is actually built on a 2,000-year-old observatory in Samarkand built by another king called Uluk Beg. So it's kind of sad what happened here because he tried his best, but he failed. And the result of that was that from 1735, that's when Jantar Mantar was built, to 1885, when J.C. Bose um, created the first uh, wireless transmitter, there is not a single name in the history of Indian science. I mean, the British brought a lot of science and technology, but there is not a single Indian name. I mean, I'm not telling you a funny story. It's a, it's a tragic story. You, sh you should be aware because it, this is the story of your country and your people. So um, anyway, let's go back to, uh, you know, this is the story of your country's struggle for, you know, rising above other countries. Now, I'll tell you about mine. Um, so, I, I studied in Maheshwari Public School, and then um, I sat for the IIT exam, um, which I could not clear in the first attempt. I had to um, give up an year. And um, then I got through to IIT Kharagpur, where I got into the chemical engineering program, but I did not study, because by that time, I had become tired of sort of running in the rat race, competing with my own friends, with my own classmates for like, you know, supremacy. So I took up sort of literature, theater, drama, these kind of things. And I did really well at them. Um, but by the time I graduated from IIT, and you know, I had, a, I had my own chemical set chemical laboratory in my room as a kid when I was younger than you. I, my father brought me an electronics hobby kit. I mean, I had no social media and Facebook and all of this to play with. So these, are, these were my toys. I built a small radio set. Um, and um, one of my best friends is sitting here. And another one used to live very close to my house. So the latest songs we used to hear, MC Hammer or Pet Shop Boys or whatever it was, we used to transmit to each other's houses via radio link. Nobody does that anymore. Has anybody played with an electronics kit over here? Has anybody played with a chemistry kit over here outside of school? I can't see. Uh, I can see why not. So one of the things is that uh, post 9/11. Uh, you, you remember the attacks on the, the Twin Towers in New York? OK. So after that, there's a, there was a worldwide sort of, um, like, you can't carry liquids on an airplane unless you buy it inside the airport. Uh, you can't carry so many things inside an airplane. So almost everything, almost every single thing in the name of um, protection from terror has become uh, a weapon. Like, I mean, if I lift this up and hit someone, that's a weapon, right? But um, if, I, if I take this spectacle, and if there's sunlight shining through it, I can burn an ant or I can burn this wood. This is a weapon. It's very dangerous. Um, so every, almost every single thing became a weapon. So 
chemistry kits, which kids used to play with when I was a kid, and they were available, went out of the market. They are extinct now. You are unable to educate yourself at home in the basic knowledge of chemistry. The same thing happened, well, electronics is coming back because the world is awash in electronic devices, but chemistry is dead. So anyway, um, once I passed out of IIT, having been sort of disillusioned by uh, its glamour and everything, I didn't want to do a software job either. I landed up with 2,000 rupees in Bombay, and I took up a job at a magazine as a writer, uh, which I was kind of good at. But then I decided that was not the thing for me, so I went freelance. Freelance means you can write for anybody for a price, but you don't have a regular job. And at that time, it was, it was kind of unusual to do that sort of thing, especially for an IIT graduate. So. Uh, very soon, um, uh, there was a sort of competition um, organized by Oxford Bookstore or, on who could write a novel in 15 days. And I wrote a sort of thriller story um, uh, based in Bombay about some hidden treasure and two or three people chasing to search as a murder and, you know, very masala. So I won the award and that sort of set off a writing career. Now, this is like a jump from chemical engineering to writing in about four months. Um, and I became a columnist. And then my job was basically to study the lives of uh, poor people in Bombay, like the underbelly, people who ran shady joints, people who lived on the street, or you know, just really not, not the glossy magazine people, but everything else. So I think by that time, I started realizing that um, the normal sort of laws of commerce, economy, success, they didn't really apply to me. I didn't really care about. In fact, this morning when I woke up and uh, in Mahavir Nagar, uh, I saw my parents after one year, and my father uh, came into my room. He said, um, Rohit, can I tell you something about your lecture? I said, uh, no. But, but then I said, OK. I, he was very anxious to say something. He said that, tell those students one thing, and I'm telling it to you right now. He said, um, there's a lot of mania right now about success and entrepreneurship, and everybody wants to be rich and a famous tycoon as soon as they pass out of school, almost, or as soon as they pass out of college, if not that. But this is wrong. This is not going to lead you anywhere, because you will get into the rat race again without even honing your basic skills without even realizing who you are. You'll be competing with everybody else for no reason. If you just focus on your desires, your knowledge, developing your skills, everything else will come automatically. So that's from my father to all of you. But I don't know how many will buy that. That's okay. So moving on. Um, the world of writing in India suddenly started exploding um, around sort of 2003. A lot of Indian novelists were winning Booker Prizes, and this, so it became really commercial. And I became increasingly uncomfortable with it because essentially, let's say if I write a novel, I'm Arundhati Roy, I write The God of Small Things, or I am Vikram Seth, um, I write a book of poetry, or um, I am um, Vikram Chandra, I write sacred games. Now anybody could get up and say, hey, that's a great book, I loved your book, I mean, you're a genius. This, this guy would get up and say, uh, I really didn't like the fourth chapter, I also had some problem with the, the characters were a little too flat, so everybody now becomes a critic. Some people who have never written a page of literature in their life will now tell you, rate you, and give you scores you are back in the examination room, right? And there is no basis for, it's, it's a completely subjective opinion. I don't care what, um, you know, for, so, I mean, almost every single opinion will be different about the same thing in this given auditorium or in the, in, in the whole country. So there is no 
fixed basis for having these opinions. The truth keeps shifting by when you interview different people. There is no, so I became very confused. I mean, this guy is saying they love my work. This guy is saying they don't love my work. I mean, am I good or am I bad? I mean, what am I doing? So where is that piece of land where I can just put my foot and say, this is the truth, this is who I am. That's what I kept searching for. And so by that time, I, I got bored of the cycle of opinions. Oh, uh, speaking of uh, social media was sort of, blogging was the big thing I was telling Kiroba earlier today. Uh, at that time, I in fact heard of him first over there. So I started a blog called Dogs Without Borders. We had 300 people from all across South Asia who were contributing and they were, co they were basically um, criticizing the media itself. This was an unprecedented phenomena in, in, in Indian history that you actually had, the internet had given a platform for us to say, hey, the Times of India is a bad newspaper. They're, they don't have any ethics and you know, they're selling editorial content and or Istan Times is doing this, or Man's World is doing this, or these guys are doing, which is a very democratic way of doing things. But uh, suddenly, so in 2004, December 26th, uh, do, you, do you remember what happened? 26th December 2004, it's probably more devastating than 9-11. The tsunami, yeah. So the tsunami happened. And um, I was sitting with a cell phone. I had a cell phone by that time in my room in Andheri West in Bombay. And I start receiving these text messages. They are from the people who write, who, who collaborate, who contribute on this blog, Dogs Without Borders. What am I receiving? These are people who are looking for dead bodies on the beaches of Sri Lanka, Andaman and Nicobar. Kanya Kumari, whatever, and they're sending me text messages that we found this, we found these graves. There's a bus inside a house. A bus has been blown over by the waves. It's sitting inside a house. And I can't ignore when I see something, and I know who it's coming from. It's a journalist, it's a friend of mine. He works for Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation. And he's looking at a bus inside a house, which has been thrown over by waves. So I started taking I, I didn't sleep for three nights. I started taking these text messages and manually started typing them on the blog in real time. The government of Sri Lanka was getting the information from this blog by this time. And then suddenly this, got, this went viral and um, we decided that this process had, has to become automatic. Like I, one man cannot process all of this. But in 2004 December, as Kiruba will attest, there was no method to send a text message which would go live on a web page. So we made a team, couple of software programmers, couple of technical guys, engineers. Uh, at that time, I, I was very uh, bad at technical stuff. I could organize stuff, but I could not program or do technical stuff myself, which is a handicap. So, but then we ended up creating a sort of system where you send a text message to a number and the number automatically sends, puts up this message on a web page. Today, in 2000, I mean, three years later, the same functionality appeared on the world as Twitter. But it was invented during the tsunami. So I, had, I was sort of moving away from literature and the arts and sort of going back into where I, where I was where I had fled from so many years ago, which was technology at the IITs. And it was happening because suddenly technology was becoming extremely powerful because of the internet as a political tool for engagement. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, where was I? Yeah, Twitter. So anyway, after that, I became, um, interested in technology for a while, I played with it. But then um, I went too kind of um, abstract with it and I did not find any satisfaction because suddenly you could make anything you wanted if you had the right uh, components, if you had the right devices, you could make whatever you wanted. So there was still no 
sort of firm place where I could say, yes, this is the truth. I kept looking. And then suddenly, one day I was reading, I, I had come back to Jaipur by that time, and I was reading a book on mathematics. And I read this um, thing again once. Uh, I'm sure you all know it, the Pythagorean theorem. It's very simple. But, I mean, so it says that the square of this and the square of this is the square of this. So a square plus b square equals c square. Right? Now this is, it seems very simple to, to actually, when you read it, you don't encounter the importance of this uh, theorem. But essentially it's true here, it's true on Saturn, it's true in some other galaxy, it's true everywhere. Your opinion of what the Pythagorean theorem is does not count like it does for uh, sort of um, uh, Vikram Chandra book or uh, Arundhati Roy book. It does not count. It's true because it's true. It can be proven as a, as a solid fact. And I love that. I love, I, I love the fact that if I write out the Pythagorean theorem on, on, a, on, a, on a blackboard, nobody can contest it. There, there's not going to be any voting. It's not a democratic fact. It's a fact devoid of opinion. So that's when I fell in love with mathematics and science because these are the areas of knowledge which give us facts which do not depend on opinions. They can be proven. Once, even if one man has proven it, it remains proven for eternity. And I think this is the highest achievement of mankind. And I started looking at the last 4,000 years of, I mean, the Pythagorean theorem is 4,000 years old now, and it is still the most fundamental fact in, in mathematics because it's not just a triangle. It's giving you the length of this diagonal, which is basically the distance between two points on a two-dimensional plane. Without the Pythagorean theorem, you have no notion of distance. Without the notion of distance, you cannot have this world around you. And so I started studying the 4,000 year history of what has mankind achieved, when, how, how was the speed of light first measured. Today, the whole world is running on the speed of light. That's electronic information. But how was the speed of light first uh, discovered? It's a fascinating, fascinating phenomena. Jupiter has four moons. They go around it like a clock hand, like four clock hands. And so this is the Earth. And this is Jupiter. The orbit of Earth is smaller. Jupiter is bigger. So sometimes the Earth is here and Jupiter is here. Sometimes Earth is here and Jupiter is here. So the distance between the Earth and Jupiter keeps changing, right? Now one guy realized, it, this was in the 1750s, one guy realized that, wow, if light has a finite speed, if the, if the speed of light is not infinite, this was not even proven back then, if the speed of light is finite, then light from Jupiter should take a shorter time when it's closer and a longer time when it's farther. So he started observing one moon of Jupiter, which is called Eo. So Eo is a small dot, goes around Jupiter like this. It's going like this. But so it's going like, say, every 22 minutes, it comes back and it's visible. Every two, it's like a clock. But as Jupiter goes farther, from the Earth, it becomes 23, 24, 25, 26. The speed of light is making, is slowing down the eclipse. By measuring the slowing down of the eclipse of Eo, he measured Ole Romer, a Danish astronomer, measured using 20 years of data of studying Jupiter, the speed of light within 2% of the value we know today. That's how fascinating for me, the history of sciences. I hope you also enjoy it uh, if you delve into it further. But if you have any questions, perhaps you can ask me uh, after this. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Rohit, for a brilliant um, session. We'll do a quick question answers. Yeah. So, um, how disappointed were your parents when you um, changed tracks from uh, being an IIT graduate to being uh, a blogger or a writer? Um, well, 
they were disappointed, obviously, because I wasn't fitting the mold. And uh, my father obviously had a plan in place for me. Um, but, you know, I mean, I had pretty much decided that I wasn't going to do the normal thing, even if it was expected of me or even if it had a fallout or if there were uh, repercussions. You know, the, once a comet is going on... What do you tell these kids how to deal with their uh, parents if they want to not uh, go into a stream and someone's pushing them? Because parents do drive their children's uh, careers uh, right. at the initial right. stage. Any special... The thing is, if, if you don't um, uh, follow your drive, if there's, a, there's an inner drive in every person, there's a gravity that's pulling you somewhere. If you don't follow that, the friction will keep on growing. So don't antagonize your parents. I mean, sometimes you can't help it, but don't antagonize them. But always be aware of the fact that uh, if you keep denying yourself that pull, you will end up destroying uh, something in the end anyway. So you have to choose. You know, so you, have, you, you, you can go along with what your parents want for a while, but if you finally do decide to take a track which is a different track, you're OK to do that? Um, Should you try and convince your parents? You, can, you should try and convince your parents, but I think in the end you should do what you really want to do. Okay, and so, so the biggest question um, that comes in everyone's mind, obviously money is what everyone wants to yeah. succeed in yeah. terms of money. As a blogger, as a, a column writer, obviously you don't end up making a lot of money, especially when you're not, write, not write, writing on non-glamorous people in Bombay. Yeah. So yeah. What, how did you survive? Well, I don't uh, make much money, obviously. That's pretty much obvious. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, I've had... I've had a life which I don't think many ple people can claim to have. Yes, I want to understand yeah. money, success yeah. in passion and what you want to do. Right. Can you compare the two? See, I think um, I'm at the wrong platform for successful people because I'm still learning. But as Kiruba uh, mentioned beautifully earlier, I'm probably a late bloomer. My okay. roots are still growing. Okay. But one day I'm going to shoot up. Sure. <laughs> so you're, you're right now imbibing. You're learning every single day of your life while you're expressing yourselves in writing. I think that'll probably remain till the day I die. Till, yeah. So that's the message yeah. for all this? Yeah, I think we, we have to be students all our lives. And I don't think there's a single day that goes by when I don't learn something amazing or something new. I mean, even this morning I was reading a book, you know, and some new thoughts were coming to my mind. So do you think uh, being successful at the very uh, onset of your career or life closes your mind into not learning new things? I think the very definition of successful, for me, the definition of successful is like, for example, what, what would be the, um, like, say, somebody who discovered helium for the first time, somebody who discovered the periodic table of elements for the first time, to see a fact of nature which no human being before you has seen before, for me, that's, that's success. That's success. I don't care about monetary... So success is not how tall one is in comparison to the other or how much more money or how many more companies he has. Yeah. It's about discovering and inventing, yeah. getting to know new things yeah. from yeah. you. Yeah, That's exactly. Exactly. So any message for the kids who are running after entrance exams, who are running after uh, becoming entrepreneurs? I know you touched on the entrepreneurship angle. Any message? Yeah, well, I would say that, uh, you know, um, um, it's, it's nice to have success and money and everything. But there is, I think there is nothing like having done something in your life. Like many people have been kings, many people have been rich, many people, nobody remembers them. We still remember Newton, we still remember Archimedes, we still remember Ramanujam. I mean, did Ramanujam become rich or successful? We still worship him literally in India. Sure. So I think at, at the end of your life, when you look back and you say, hey man, I did something that nobody else did before, I think that pleasure is uncomparable. Great. Audience, um, questions? Yeah. Mike, please. Okay. So, being a blogger, uh, what's the best thing a blogger can give to his readers? And what's your own, uh, what's your own, uh, what I call, what's your own strategy to make your blog more attractive and fascinating to the readers? So, they do keep coming on your page and for to read well, more. I mean, I, I don't, I, I blog because, you know, that's a platform I have I have access to now because of the internet. But I'm not a blogger per se. I, I basically research in libraries and um, I, I try to make new connections in the history of science and mathematics. And when I make those new connections, I share them as, um, as uh, you know, clearly and honestly as I can. 
but I don't think there's a blogger sort of strategy to it. Is, is blogging your emotional outburst or it's just sharing of knowledge as Kiruba said? No, it's the fact that I have a platform, right? On sure. which, on which no, nobody's paying me to do it. I can say whatever I want, so I have no obligations. It's a, it's a kind of freedom I exercise. Okay, but so you don't do anything extraordinary for people to uh, come to your blog more, more than what they normally are doing? But people come to my blog because nobody writes about the subjects I write. So that's the yes. answer to your question. And he does write something that's no one, that content is not available anywhere else. That's why people, any other question? So my question is, uh, a talk that you give is uh, based on subjective interpretation by the audience. So sir, why did you agree to uh, give a talk if uh, your opinion about subjective interpretation is that you don't have a field to, uh, to say that that is the truth? No, I, uh, you have the right to say everything. But at the end of the day, what you believe about what I said is what is important. I mean. Everybody's going to take away different things. Um, you know, I'm probably a less powerful communicator than Kiruba or the people who will come after me. But maybe one thing I've said will remain in your mind for a long time. So my job is done, you know. It's not about just the truth. It's also about being able to communicate the truth. So that's what I try to do. And it's not just all of you getting, taking that one thing. It's one person taking something and the other person taking something. You know, you never know what's... Yeah. Uh, what's common between his life and the lives of any other students and you know if you relate to a speaker that's what you take back if there's no relation to the speaker you don't take anything back so i'm sure people can relate to his story or his experiences uh, you said that kids should uh, do really what they want to really do now i have a son too and uh, he's doing btech and lately he said dad i think i like to give it up actually in a perfect world, that's exactly what I would be doing. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Now I'll tell you his past. He was in Xavier's and he cleared for Fiji and uh, I was quite against it. Anyway, he went, he did Fiji for about a month and I offered him, you want to come back? He came back, back to his old school. Then he cleared for an exam going to Bombay for NM college. Now again, within four months, I could see where he was going as a father and I sort of offered him to come back if you wanted to, and if you wanted to pursue something else. He's back, but he's again in B.Tech doing in the college year. Now, lately, he's realized that uh, he doesn't want to do it. What do you think I should be telling him? See, I can't give you advice as a father because I'm not a father. And I've never been, the, I've made a conscious choice that I'm not, not going to have children. Because I, I, I have a very dark kind of view uh, that, um, you know, we live in a extremely uh, high pressure society where kids are thrust into an oven of competition too soon and I think if we just sort of take off that pressure a bit from the kids and students that just do what you want to do, have fun, don't worry too much about success, I think that would be a healthy, healthier society rather than pushing everyone, you know, achieve, achieve, achieve. I think for me but that my question is, I, how can you tell a child to do what he wants to do? How does he know what he really wants to do is what he is supposed to do or what he is good at or... Uh... Well, until I, see, I'll tell you what my father did. Until I reached the age of 18, he didn't really tell me what to do. He would just sort of push toys in my room, you know, like, okay, here's what I got for you, here's what I got for you. He never told me, but by the age of 18, he expected me to make, have made a, some kind of decision. Okay, thank you, uh, Rohit.